<laughs> and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a pair of returning good brothers to the temple. Coming to us straight from Apotheosis Studios, the the team the team who you may have who you may have heard of previously from the Red Opera, now with Sirens Battle of the Bards. In the blue corner we have Jam we have Jameson Stone. In the red corner we have David Granjo. How the hell are we doing today? Uh, doing fantastically. Glad to glad to be back and uh, excited to excited to talk about gaming and and sirens and red opera and all sorts of good stuff with you guys. Yes, very excited. Yeah. So, first off, con congrats on managing to get the red opera out there. Um, I'm cur I'm currently taking steps on bringing it into my temple. It's just mm. it's just going to take a while because I I lean on the ambitious end of things. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Um, so, the, the, obviously I gotta start at the humble beginnings when it comes to Sirens. How did this particular idea come about? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So, uh, here at Apotheosis, um, we just enjoy making really high quality games and books, um, after the success of the Red Opera. Uh, we always, uh, even while we were working on the Red Opera, had our eyes on working on another book. And even now, um, as we're finishing, um, Sirens, we have our eyes on, on our future works too. We, you know, kind of constantly have to be moving forward as an organization. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, we really enjoyed doing, um, for the Red Opera, uh, having it be a Warlock based book. Um, Warlocks are really rad, um, you know, super dark and broody with archfey and fiends and you know a warlock ruled city um and we wanted to try something a little bit lighter something a little bit brighter um and so uh, bards was a, a really natural um natural next step um i also uh, got married to satine phoenix who is a bard and has run sirens um for a long time uh, originally it was sirens of the realms on D and D's twitch channel and then uh just became sirens uh, she she got the ip back from uh, from uh, Wizards of the Coast for herself. Um, and so it was a, a really natural project to collaborate with. Um, working with her is absolutely fantastic. Uh, she's an amazing game master and uh, game developer. Um, and so, yeah, we've, we've had a lot of fun now doing a, a Bard book mm -hmm. that people can check out at thebardbook.com. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that does bring me to, that does bring me to, to the, to the question, um, because it, it sounds like after the Red Opera, you wanted to do another cl another um, class themed book. What's the appeal when it comes to bards in in your guys' opinion? Yeah, I think bards are a really incredibly under leveraged class. Um, I think that historically bards kind of had a bad rap. Um, <laughs> I think that they um, were seen in a negative light, and um, I think they're actually a really very fantastic and and, and powerful class. Um, I think a lot of the, the kind of the tropey stuff around bards, whether it's like the wandering minstrel or, you know, sometimes the, you know, over, you know, I don't know, over, over sexed character um, really is, is just kind of tropey um, and, and needs to be left in the past. I think when we take a look at what this class actually has to offer, um, it really is a fantastic class of artists. Um, we are bards. I'm a writer. You know, David Granjo is a, an amazing visual artist and now art director. Um, so we are bards in real life. I, I would say that, you know, maybe you too, Mindra, is a, a podcasting monastery running bard, um, you know, to be able to play these classes now uh, within 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons and other TTRPGs is a really amazing opportunity for roleplay. And, and how do we bring in this ability to evoke emotion, evoke new thoughts, um, and inspire people through our art? That's what we do every day. Um, and so we really wanted to shine a new light on this class um, so people can have an updated version of it. Yeah. I do think you're onto something when it comes to when it comes to bards getting a bad rap because they've been the they've been one of the longest running memes in fantasy gaming i'd if i were to hazard a guess cuz no one thing results in that kind of thing but i think a lot of people get hung up on the musical instrument part the troubadour um part of it when yep you meant you mentioned you mentioned all three all three of us being bards and i don't i can only speak for myself but um, I am not getting in front of instrument unless I'm being handsomely paid. 
Well, I think I think that's a that's a really important distinction. Um, a bard doesn't just have to be a minstrel, it, it, mm -hmm. and and that's that's really what, how we're leaning in it with this book. We are we are seeing bards from the lens of an artist. Mm -hmm. um, that and music is one art form, and that yeah. there are many art forms. Uh, writing is a bard. You can be an you know oration bard. Mm -hmm. That there are introverted and extroverted bards too. Yeah. When you look at a creative project, there's a whole long litany of people who go into creating that project. Mm -hmm. um, Within our book, we uh, are currently only talking about uh, two, sometimes three of the subclasses. I'm happy we can talk about the third too. Yeah. Um, we have the College of Anatomy, and that's mm -hmm. someone who really understands how the anatomy of the human body operates. And so you can be an amazing, you know, uh, artist to draw that, or you know, a dexterity-based class like a monk that knows how to dance and then can use their body to lure lure an audience to distract them. And then from a combat perspective, understands how the human body works so precisely that they can, you know, dismantle that body if they need to through martial arts, um, or ground that person non-lethally if that's how they choose to play their character. I want to point out how sly you were with that by by sliding in the monk part of it. <laughs> I that's that's some good pandering if I did if I say so myself. Hey, we're at the monastery, <laughs> man. So I do want to I do want to shift into the visual design. Now, when I had you on for the when I had you on for the Red Opera, um I distinctly remember you mentioning that a significant inspiration for the um for the vi for the visual approach that you wanted to go with was the Darksiders series of games. And obviously we can't exactly do that for this. So I'm cu I'm curious what's I'm curious what some of the visual motifs you were dr you were drawing from when it came to establishing the look of Sirens. Uh I think I think most of the 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 visual the visuals that we see now on 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 Sirens came from the idea of the city being level of, with all the levels mm -hmm. uh, and these statues. So when when the project, when we start to talk about the, the visual part of the project, there, there was this like kind of romanticized idea of pulling from the masters, mm -hmm. uh, like Leonardo da Vinci and, and all the sculptures and, and paintings. So you're like, okay, how can we how can we like now because the city and the story the way they are built they pretty much pulling reference from those masters so as a personally as an artist that became like that city and building the city became a playground where we can like play with what we've learned during school during art school um for instance when I can kind of give an Easter egg maybe on on the on the city. Uh, there are many statues that are posed ex like inspired by paintings from the masters. I think we have Caravaggio and those kind of paintings. Yeah. So um, and also how they serve to be the structure. In the, uh, and with Carlos mm -hmm. and we are pretty pretty excited to 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 show you what what we will be able to do with that yeah now obviously obviously um one of the things one of the things I was quick to point out when it came to the red opera was musical integration and in this 
in this particular case, it would be remiss to <laughs> to not have that particular angle. So, um, I'd like you to I'd like you to tell me the story about how, about how you got in contact with Jason Charles Miller for the um, soundtrack. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our soundtrack, um, again, we have a full uh, full orchestral soundtrack uh, mm -hmm. for Sirens Battle of the Bards, just like we had for the Red Opera. Obviously, the Red Opera was in conjunction with Dia Morte, uh, the heavy metal and kind of operatic uh, rock band. Mm -hmm. um, and super happy how that came out. Uh, it was fantastic, very fitting for that, um, for that story. Um, for Sirens Battle of the Bards, it's set out in the desert. Uh, there's a, a much more different feel. It's kind of like a fantasy, you know, desert nights, Arabian, um, with a little bit of actually like EDM um, mixed in, uh, very progressive. Um, so we, you know, reached out into our network. Uh, we have an in-house in composer named uh, Taylor Borgen, uh, mm -hmm. who is uh, composing the vast majority of the tracks for our soundtrack. And we've reached out to some other people too, including um, Jason Charles Miller. Now, Jason is a bard. Like <laughs> He is such a perfect example of a bard and a musical bard too. Um, and he plays Brig on Sirens, uh, which is uh, game mastered by Satine Phoenix. Mm -hmm. um, and he is a war lute. So he actually, his musical instrument is an actual weapon. Um, it's made with, uh, you know, special metal and he actually goes swing around. He, he plays a rogue bard multi-class. Um, it's an absolutely fantastic show uh, for people who enjoy um, live streams. Mm -hmm. uh, it's on uh, Satine Phoenix's Twitch channel. And we, they currently have a season running right now. And I believe that our next episode is, I can look, um, is next week on Monday, which is pretty cool. So um, working with Jason, it, music just flows out of him. So uh, he did the song, our kind of theme song for this project. And it's featured on the uh, Kickstarter video. Uh, Satine sang it. And Jason, Satine, and myself, we wrote the lyrics for it. Uh, it took us about six and a half, seven hours on a Saturday afternoon to write out all the lyrics. Um, and then uh, Jason created the music and went back and forth with us with iterations. Um, and it was just a real pleasure. Um, Jason also has, oh gosh, what is it called? I think it's called Bardic Inspiration, actually. Uh, has a, another show. He does a lot of Twitch streaming. Um, and that's on Idol Champions Twitch stream. And they actually create um, Dungeons and Dragons theme songs every week, right on the fly. He just makes makes music with his fans and followers uh, in, in the chat. Um, and it's really fantastic. And, mm -hmm. and he, he is the perfect example of a musical bard. Yeah. Um, and you can just feel it in everything that he does. Um, and again, not all bards need to be musicians. Um, but this bard is very musical and it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, since given the given the music thing, I'd be I'd be remiss if I didn't bring this kind of thing up. Um, the thing that really helped see, really helped view really helped um, me look at bards aside from just music was a um, a game that came a game that came out in France in the early 2000s that I stumped that I stumbled upon called Agone. Um and in that one you had spell instead of having just a unified spell list, they had spell lists for different for different types of ins, for different types of instruments and different types of interpretations. Dance was one um one for one for drums, you don't which is something you don't see often. Most bards most bard instruments are always wood and string instruments <laughs> and even one for painting now i that said i do fe i do feel remiss that i to address one particular elephant in the room that's decided to take a crash on my couch <laughs> and that is that um a lot of a lot of this is based on the on um, satine's sirens live play so with that kind of thing in mind, would foreknowledge of that live play be necessary for someone to dive into this? Oh, absolutely not. Um, you know, uh, Satine, Satine's live play um, is a you know fantastic fount of of knowledge that we can draw upon, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have characters. All of the sirens are characters in the books. Um, all a lot of our our her kind of. The nemesis from from Sirens, the Emerald Cabal, is one of the the major antagonist groups in our books. Um, but we've created this to be a standalone um, adventure and campaign setting, mm -hmm. so people can come in with no knowledge um, of any of that and still enjoy it. But people who do love Sirens and um, you know they are incredibly excited about the project, they will find familiar faces, um, familiar enemies, um, and a new new world in which to engage with uh, within Sirens Battle of Bards. Um, 
And it's just, it's been really amazing, honestly, to have Satine's experience as a game master part of this project too. Mm -hmm. um, she really, I, I, I believe, and um, you know, the player base is there to support it, is, is one of the greatest game masters alive right now. Um, mm -hmm. She's been doing this for a very long time, um, is incredibly well respected within the industry. Um, and the her ability to visualize even just the layout of the book um, has been really fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, David, maybe maybe you can add, you know talk a little bit about um, some of the layout differences and, and, and some of the enhancements that we have of um, from the Red Opera versus Sirens and some of the ways that we've kind of leveled up as a studio uh, in, in, in that regard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's definitely having setting definitely showed us like what not to do. <laughs> That 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 will save us. That will save us more time and and optimize uh, not only the workflow but also giving room for creativity. Um, where on the Red Opera, I mean, the Red Opera, we 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 had since we have a more graphic novel background, um, we we didn't knew about so much. Uh, of the rules uh, that a layout should follow, um, and setting really helped us uh, with that. Now we are super proud with what we did with the Red Opera, and and even we had the chance to for setting to look at it, and really a couple of like months of yep. wrapping up the book. Yep. Uh, she was super like helpful and and giving us guidelines to. Oh, maybe nudge that there and, and remove that or add that, um, and it refined the book so well. And now we are really excited to see with her guidance what we can do um, with sirens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now I want I want to shift into the city of Silvata itself, and I am beginning to not uh, notice a pattern because because with both si with both sirens and the red opera you have it very much set in one particular um, settlement, but I, now I'm not gonna I'm not gonna ask you to go through all of the districts, but I, but since each one is meant to have its own theme, I'd like you to give me a, a couple examples of so, of some of the potential districts and what their themes are. Absolutely, yeah. So um. Again, um, for those who are, are maybe not super familiar, uh, we have um, actually have this is our wormwood box, and um, within the the wormwood um, uh, dice tray, this is a, an image of Selvata, and so you can kind of see here it's a multi multi tiered city, mm -hmm. um, and there's mul multiple discs. So I'll give you a little bit of a background on kind of how how Selvata was created. So originally, a group of bards and druids were just traveling through the desert um, uh, on the verge of of of, of, of of exhaustion and dehydration of dying of thirst they stumbled upon an oasis beautiful beautiful oasis and it was literally their you know saving grace so they gave thanks to the gods um the gods having created this oasis as this kind of gem in the middle of the desert smiled down upon them and blessed these waters with this magical essence of kesaba um, which was incredibly incredible potent and powerful. It allowed the druids and the bards uh, to amplify all of their magical abilities um, and their artistic pursuits extraordinarily. Um, so they celebrated. It was it, it happened on, on on an eclipse. So um, later, the next next one hundred years for the next next eclipse, mm -hmm. they did the exact same thing. They came back to the the, the sacred waters and they gave another um, blessing and 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 gave thanks. And the gods once again smiled on down before them and they created another disc utilizing this magic and this has happened every 100 years except for the third time the third the third iteration of this their um kind of celebration wasn't good enough for the gods the gods said eh, you know it's not worth our time um and so they actually didn't bless those sacred waters during that that period so our disc three instead of being able to build another disc they just built it out and disc three is a little bit larger it's a little bit darker it's a little bit dirtier it's it's, a, it's just a little bit a little bit more earthy um having you know, reflecting some of the failure of them not not being able to, you know, make make another tier. Um, on the, the the next cycle of a hundred years for the next eclipse, the bard stepped in and said, "Okay, listen, druids, um, you guys aren't really natural performers. You're not great. You know, not 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 really 
super charismatic. That's not your strong point. Let us step in. We're going to entertain the gods. And so they did. And so for every subsequent hundred years, they built higher and higher and higher. Each year or each each cycle for each grand invocation, they built a new disc. And each disc is a representation of their highest learning. Um, on the bottom of the disc are mosaics that show kind of the failures that they had to overcome to achieve what they've achieved. Um, as David had mentioned, there are these beautiful statues holding these discs up. And now, after 1,100 years, uh, 10, or it's really 9, with a hopeful 10, mm -hmm. successful grand invocation, uh, this is the last time. And the gods have said, okay, guys, this is it. No more invocations. This is the last one. And so Calrath, he's the grand chancellor. He's a divination wizard. He knew this was coming. And he has been able to kind of catalyze and, and, and polarize the city to say, we, we need to do something here. We need to actually build some sort of capping stone so we are no longer reliant on the gods. Um, because when when this portal opens and they draw down this, this heavenly energy, they need to try to maintain that connection open so they no longer need to constantly be entertaining the gods. Mm -hmm. The Emerald Cabal, however, who many people know from Sirens, they have different plans. So they've infiltrated the city as well. They wish to call down, not a god, but something a little bit more fiendish, uh, something that they worship and do, do deals with. And so uh, we have our party kind of thrown in the middle of this. Um, to answer your questions from the differentiation of the disc, disc one is much more like a tourist attraction. It allows people to come in. It allows people to be excited. Um, there's, uh, you know... There's restaurants and bars and places to shop. It's almost like Epcot meets Disney World meets Paris and all, all you know, fantastical things. Mm -hmm. Disc two, however, uh, is much, much more of a wealthy disc. Disc two has, um, it's 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 made for for the actual people of the city itself. Disc three is is where most of the the people work and live. Disc four and five and, and it goes higher and higher and higher. Each mm -hmm. each disc feeling more ethereal um, and more magical as you get up to disc ten, which they're currently building now, which is this 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 uh, capping stone of Metatron's cube, which will be a, a a large magical item that allows them to maintain this open connection with the heavens above. Mm -hmm. Now. This was kind of answered when you brought up one of the subclasses that's going to be involved. But given that the, given that this is a book that is leaning heavily towards bards, um, how how much of a, how much of a necessity would it be for a, for it be for a party to have at least one to have at least one bard in the in that particular party running this campaign? Yeah, fantastic question. You can run this campaign perfectly. You have an amazing time, a fantastic adventure with not a single bard in your party. Um, there is, is no necessity to have bards here. Um, uh, again, you can run the Red Opera without at, at all. You don't need a warlock in your party. Um, we really are trying to lean into this idea that we have a setting that this city itself feels very bardic. Mm -hmm. Or for the Shadelands and Yonkot, the city itself feels very warlockian. I, I don't know if that's the, the right way to, to say that, but it sounds good, so I'm going to stick with it. Add it to um, the dictionary. <laughs> warlockian. Um, uh, from this perspective, we, we've created a unique setting for game masters to run their games mm -hmm. with a unique story and campaign based around that setting that focuses on a class. Um, uh, again, within the Shadelands of Yonkoth, our criminal underground are a bunch of clerics. Um, normally, you don't think of clerics being part of the criminal underground, but clerics really hate warlocks. Um, and so the clerics want, you know, death to all warlocks. And so they have created an underground society based around that. Mm -hmm. um, the same can be true, uh, not with clerics, but the criminal underground um, in our city of, of Selvata are a bunch of, of druids. Um, and then we have some others who are really actually trying to reclaim nature back and reclaim the sacred power. And they've created a resistance uh, to resist the Emerald Cabal and to resist the um, the nobles who rule the city. Um, again, you don't need to be a bard to enjoy that adventure. Um, if, if you want to try your hand at bard, we have a bunch of really cool uh, bard subclasses that you can take on to get a taste of bard, even if it's just temporary. Um, but you have entered into the city under the guise of being part of a band, uh, part of a group, a performance group, for the Grand Invocation. That's how you've gotten into the city. The city itself is actually on lockdown for this Grand Invocation because it is so incredibly important. And those higher discs, it gets harder and harder and harder to infiltrate those discs unless you are part of the Grand Invocation. Mm -hmm. So Vlanya, who is kind of the our, our 
agent who's you know gives gives our adventure hook or call to adventure has um, gotten you in as one of the um, one of the groups in this kind of tiered contest to have the opportunity to perform in front of the gods. Um, you don't have to do that if you don't want to, um, but that's that is kind of the way that you've infiltrated the city. And you could be a, a group of barbarians, but if you'd like to try your hand at bard, you can be some bard barbarians too. Mm -hmm. And we have specialty <laughs> subclasses that lean into that. So you no longer have to have charisma and performance be your primary attribute. You actually, for that, uh, for some of our subclasses, can have strength be your primary attribute. And we have dexterity and intelligence and wisdom. Um, mm -hmm. So you can augment your current existing characters uh, to have a little bit of, of bardic creative essence to them. Yep. Now, one of the ma one of the major taglines when it comes to when it comes to sirens is a si is a city of artists where bards inspire revolution and the concept of inspiring revolution is what I is what I want to touch on primarily with this because that's that's a set that's a setup that can have a lot of different interpretations so what I'm curious is what what sort of theming are you are you building that phrase around or is that, or would that be too much of a spoiler? Yeah. So, um, kind of as as I touched upon, we have we have this 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 um, underground resistance that are trying to overflow, or excuse me, overthrow the government of um, of Selvata. They uh, Selvata has hoarded this magical Kesaba essence. Um, and they have prevented other people from being able to actually enjoy what the gods have given the city and given the oasis. Mm -hmm. And because of this, um, many people within the city feel incredibly cheated, as they should. Um, it, it's basically a version of trickle-down economics. It, 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 you can see from, um, from, from our image, and I, maybe those who are only listening, I can't see this, but our disc, there's, there's waterfalls that actually flow down. Mm -hmm. And that's because uh, the actual well source in the Kesaba at the, at the base of, of the actual um, oasis goes up through this central column called the... Um, this uh, central uh, central channel, the uh, the grand siphon, and it siphons all of the Kesaba out, so the nobles at top can have more and have a higher percentage of that magical essence. Mm -hmm. Well, people on disc one, two, three, four, and even disc five, they're very upset about this, and so um, Vlania has tried to step in and and kind of basically. In, in, encourage the population and, and dissent has already been there there's already a very strong resistance movement um to have have equality and and luckily we we learn we lean into player agency so the players actually get to decide how they want to steer this rebellion mm -hmm. they may want to ally themselves with the emerald cabal they may want may want to infiltrate the emerald cabal um in the hopes of overthrowing them um they may want to do nothing and sit back and just watch you know watch the entire city burn um players do you know really interesting things mm -hmm. um and then we have other agents um uh, one of whom is um uh you know we have uh Vlania, then we have all the sirens and we have vajra and that's a character based off of myself who's a demon hunter and he actually really wants a demon to come through this portal so if he can kill it he has his own motivations and reasons for why he wants to do that mm -hmm. and Vanya doesn't want a demon to come in a demons cause havoc uh, so we have all these kind of you know differing perspectives and we have a faction tracker to actually help the player and help the game master know exactly how the players are tracking with these different factions uh, we have the emerald cabal Calrath, who kind of represents the the standard government and the resistance um, and then we have a fame and infamy tracker, too, of how the actual city reacts to your party as well. Uh, if you do incredibly well within the performances, you have a high fame, and that grants a lot of boons and has some drawbacks. Um, but if you are become infamous, if you join the Emerald Cabal, that has, you know, maybe people are afraid of you and they stay away from you and they let you do what you want. Um, but then, you know, they're, they're, again, everything has consequences. All choices do. So we, we really want to lean into player agency. Mm -hmm. Now... With now, um, when it comes to you've met, you mentioned a few, you mentioned a few of these a few of the subclasses and is it would it be fair to, would it be fair to say that there's that not all of the sub, not all of the subclass editions are going to be for um for bar for bards. I know you mentioned uh, so the they're, monkeys. They're all bard. They're all bardic okay. subclasses. Right. So it's they're they are all bardic subclasses. We've really tried to break down kind of what 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 is it to be a bard. Mm -hmm. um, again, a, a bard evokes emotion, 
and 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 can you know bring thoughts made manifest um I, let's even like let's let's turn to david you're you're an artist what how what do you conceive as an artist as your 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 job or your role like why do you do art what is the purpose of art <laughs> that's a big question but like this, 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 ties, this ties into our subclasses that's like the question why are we human <laughs> totally <laughs> this is a part of question um i think thinking what from what we've been designing from for the city and the running thing the theme that we've been uh at least the the, the pattern that have we've been finding is the representation of what of the 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 city and through the statues so the statues one of the challenges is to represent how powerful they can be through art right and this is kind of what the job what the 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 art at least that we are doing is representing a a this story through through visuals right mm -hmm. well for the book it's kind of more it's more uh it's a 50 50 with text and and and, and art but we still need art to uh, be able to show things and text to be able to make the campaign. And so it's not only the art of creating the overall book, but also how the story and 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 it's funny because this goes into the writers too because we are creating this book and this story but it involves like james was saying all the bards involved like the art and the writers uh and the layout artists um and the musicians i mean um so maybe i'm just rumbling uh what that is there is is evoking emotion and bringing ideas and making them manifest in 3d physical space exactly. so we can have an idea in our in our head we can have an idea in our heart but we need to make that real and share it with other people there are a lot of ways to do this um and even from a combat perspective so uh, w one of our one of our subclasses is the college of geometry and this is a a intelligence based bard um, most likely would be taken as a multi-class with a wizard and someone who is using the beauty of mathematics of 3d physical shapes uh, based upon the platonic solids mm -hmm. uh, which actually play very heavily within the city design itself carlos has done a fantastic job of incorporating metatron's cube the flower of life um, and, and other sacred geometry aspects into the creation of our city and the city itself is a superstructure it's a mm -hmm. It's a, a gigantic magical item to be um, this, this, you know, gateway and portal into the, the higher, you know, heavenly realms. So someone who takes this, this subclass or takes this multi-class will use both fractals um, and sacred geometry to actually cast spells. And this can be creating physical shapes in manifest reality, both to bind other creatures, to create cover for their... Um, or for their, their party members and create things of beauty to awe and inspire those around them. And that, again, is an intelligence-based bar leaning into the beauty of mathematics. Um, again, and we described before, a, a dexterity-based bard um, using the beauty of the physical body, um, how they move, how they dance, um, how, how they understand how anatomy works so they can better uh, subdue and attack um, their opponents while simultaneously entertaining and inspiring both their their party members and anyone, you know, any onlookers. Um, and this is people in real life. You know, it, it's amazing to me how creative and artistic people are. Some of these people do this as their full-time job, like us at Apotheosis Studios. We are full-time artists. Um, and uh, you know we have project management bars, you know things like that. It's, yeah. that, that those that is not a subclass in the book, but um, <laughs> that, is, that is a subclass that we have at, at our studio. Um, other people do these things um, as a hobby, um, and we want to offer people the ability to role play this in a fun and creative way, so they can also be artists. And an artist doesn't have to be um, just someone who creates art for fun. You know, within the fantastical world of fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons and and other TTRPGs as well, um, we have you know a summoning bard, someone who draws uh, you know draws a picture and then invokes that into life, and then that creature jumps off of the page and into combat for them. 
And these are things that they don't have to do right in the moment. They're not going to be on a battlefield, be like, oh, hold on, let me do a quick charcoal drawing. No, they, they have this in a tube rolled up and then they choose whichever creature they wish to have come to life. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that they prepare um, almost like an artificer or, or artificer, depending on how you want to pronounce it. The internet argues with itself on how you pronounce uh, that, that class. Mm -hmm. um, how they then, they prepare spells and they prepare their things in the background to unleash on the battlefield. Um, and from a role-playing perspective, um, they get to be, you know, fantastic artists, which which is great. Um, I, I love seeing all the art that comes out of the studio. David does such a great job. So does Carlos. Um, so does Sharon. Uh, Diana as well. And, and, and also Satine. All are fantastic artists. And it shapes the way that they think and conceptualize, you know, their place in the world. And so, again, we're giving opportunities for people to be able to role-play these things and have it be exciting, you know, exciting combat opportunities for our very, very unique epic adventures. Yeah. Now, first off, I, I want to say I want to say that I I am very thankful for the fact that in fi in five or so years, if by some miracle you end up doing a monk themed book, I will not have to answer the question of what it what it what does it mean to be a monk or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and if I just jinx myself, then so be it. <laughs> Although, um, if some if someone puts in a project management bard as a subclass, I'm blaming you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, logistics bard, yeah, exactly. The con contract we've we've had we've joked around with a contract bard and a lawyer bard. Um, <laughs> I I would love to work with the lawyer bard because a lot of contracts and, and legalese are just painful to read, um, and I, I try to make our contracts as pain painless as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't I don't know if I would dare say that they are beautiful, but they are less painful than than most legalese. Haven't you ever heard "Beauties in the Eye of, of the Beholder"? And that yeah, is a double well. pun. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I do I do want to congratulate you on the fact that you managed to get funded in about four in about forty minutes. Thank um, you. Now I now um at the time of this recording you are sitting pretty close to two to two hundred k. You're just you're just under it. With ten with ten days to go, um, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for the digital version? Uh, so for the we 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 hope to have our book out um, by holiday season. Uh, the digital version will definitely be done um, way in advance of that. Um, that's that is what we believe we can do, barring any additional like shipping disasters. Um, right now, shipping uh, internationally, um, and we we print overseas. Uh, to save money for our backers so we can have a cost-effective book as possible, uh, particularly with the specialty books that we're doing. Um, shipping right now is crazy. Uh, we are living in a worldwide pandemic. Uh, we've had multiple shipping disasters, uh, such as the Suez Canal disaster. Even though that that is not part of our um, trade lane, um, we don't go through Egypt through when we do any of our shipping. Um, that single blockage has actually slowed down all shipping containers throughout the entire world. Um, we, you know, the planet Earth is a very large place, but the actual globing global trade community um, is 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 relatively small. A tiny little infraction like that actually has massive, massive effects. Um, luckily, most people don't have to think about these things. They just, you know, buy their stuff off of Amazon. But funny enough, it actually has great, great effect. So. Um, we can't we don't know if something like that's gonna happen again um i kind of just assume that it will but we don't know so we hope to have everything done by holiday season um but you know all all we can control is what we do on our end and so much like the red opera um we're going to have our pdf and and you know the vast majority of our merchandise done on time um but the actual creation of a book um for for folks who, who are viewing this is this is the red opera here um it's a large large book this is mm -hmm. 320 pages it's a uh, 2d6 bludgeoning damage actually uh, when 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 hit um there's actually metallic inlay in the actual book itself which is mm -hmm. pretty cool uh this is hammered metal x um and um, it, it's no small feat um, to then ship out, you know, thousands of copies of, of this book to our backers. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, cer I'll certainly be keeping a close eye on how, on how things develop. And in, full dis in the interest of full disclosure, I will note that, I, that of the nearly 2,000 backers, you can, count the, you can count the monk and the monastery among them. Yeah! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but... I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come back up, come back up to the temple. And 
anytime you guys see fit to return, whether it's whether it's for a future thing or ju or just to or just to rant about just to rant about how how um OP source saladins are or palavers as they're called here. <laughs> um, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank, th th thank you so thank much. You. Yeah, we, we pre appreciate hanging out with you and, and talk, talking some, some bardic stuff in the monastery. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, Stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>